Hi, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to Evoke Therapy Program's broadcast. I'm Dr. Brad Reedy. Today is Tuesday, January 16th, 2024. Tonight's broadcast, for those of you that might not be familiar with our format, every other format, we have a topic, and then we have a live Q&A with current alumni of our program. So any questions that they want to send in throughout, I will address in the order that they're received. You can always, even if you're just a listener and you're not an alumni of our program, you can always send in questions, suggestions, feedback. You can ask for copies of slides. We just will provide those for you of, of slides from our content, uh, from, from our topic broadcast. So we're happy to provide that for you. Use the email webinar at evoketherapy.com to communicate it with us. So that's the best way to get the information. So before I get into the pre-submitted questions, we have a couple of pre-submitted questions this evening. I'm going to just go over what's coming up. What's coming up in February, February 7th through 11th, there's a spot left. There's a couple, meaning there's a, there's a spot for a couple left for the couples workshop. My wife, Michelle Reedy, and I will be hosting, facilitating, and running the couples workshop. Michelle is also a therapist, marriage and family therapist. So we come at this with similar orientations, of course, and we have our different perspectives. One of the things that I believe in firmly as a core pillar of this work in fact, I was just reading a book where it stated it so eloquently, I'm going to share it in my social media over the next couple of days, that says that every relationship that we have is, is basically based on the relationship we have with ourselves. And since most people are unconscious of so much, this is the work to uncover that. So sitting across and watching your partner do their family of origin work gives you compassion understanding patience for them. It's easy to see the vulnerable little child when you get to see it. I've said that in psychotherapy over the years that it's not my job to love people. It's my job to understand people, to see them. But of course, when I understand people and see them, loving comes automatically after that. So this is an opportunity for couples to be able to do their work together. If you're interested in finding you and you want to do this as a couple, now is the time. We have this offering for now just once a year. And we do get requests from couples at other times to come to finding you together. And we typically don't allow for that. And the last thing I'll say about that is you get as much work out of watching other people do, do their work as you would out of an individual. When we started our intensive program now, nine years ago, my first thought was that the couples, the multi couples work that I would be doing would be something that everybody would, would flock to, but effort after effort, attempt after attempt, to schedule one of these, I found that the couples wanted to do the work on their own because they found that their problems were very unique and, and it was an intimate thing to share them. But what I will tell you is when people go through this process, they feel more alike than they, than they do different. And I think there's value to that. So if you're interested, February 7th through 11th is that offering for 2024. You can contact intensives at evoketherapy.com for this or to learn anything else. So let me get to my pre-submitted questions. And then we'll get to any live questions that are submitted by the live audience. Let's go with the first question. The first question reads, could Dr. Reedy speak on family relationship between older parents, older children, and grandchildren? I have a 43-year-old son and a 38-year-old son. My older son is not married, has narcissistic issues, and struggled on many levels. My younger son is married with a five-year-old son. I'm hoping Dr. Reedy can address some thoughts, behaviors, and dynamic that naturally exist and develop in these kinds of relationships. You know, I'm going to give you the, the broad answer and then I'll get more narrow as I go. It is my belief that there is, is there are more similarities between parenting older children and parenting younger children than people tend to believe. It's like uh, sometimes I, I hear parents as I'm teaching or talking or facilitating groups They'll say to me, well, my child's issue is, is significantly different. Maybe they're on the autism spectrum. Maybe they're an addict. Maybe they're not acting out and at home, they, they get along with parents, but they're self-harming and they're struggling on, on more subtle and nuanced ways. Um, sometimes it's, well, my children are younger. Sometimes it's my children are older, like in this question. But more often than not, in fact, I remember, I remember the specific moment where I was walking into therapy and I was thinking about this, this kind of question. I was thinking, 
the way that, that I treat my clients is uh, more of a template for the way to treat everybody in some ways. Don't give advice that's not asked for. And even when you are asked for it, be reluctant to be specific and don't use words like should and you must and you need to. Show and, and, and demonstrate compassion and non-judgment. Don't be intrusive. Be encouraging, right? Set clear boundaries. That, that's a, a foundational idea of any relationship. And, and I came across this quote sometime later with this famous psychotherapist that said, the proper way of treating a child is the proper way of treating another human being. I think what happens with parents of older kids is, I'm going to use the word lazy, but it's, it's not the right word because that has a negative connotation. But it's for now, it's the word that I'm going to use. I think parents get lazy around their boundaries with the older children. They think they can say things because the child has grown up and the child is a, a full grown adult. But remember this, there still is a dynamic for most people. The, the exception is rare and the exception comes from a tremendous amount of, of, of work on yourself. The child still sees the parent in a way that the parent doesn't see the child. The space that you occupy in your child's mind is a fundamentally different space than the space that they occupy in yours. You still are a big person. And even though they might vociferously object to this idea by saying, I know my parents are flawed, I know that, but you still matter. How you feel about them still matters. At least it will be an echo. So I think the biggest mistake that parents of older children make is they're intrusive. They give advice. They, they, they get very judgmental about parents and, and the, the way that the parent is, is parenting the grandchild in this case. And they think it, they can get away with it because what they're looking at is somebody in their 30s or 40s who looks like a regular adult, who looks like a full-grown adult. And so how could it really harm or hurt them? But I, I submit to you that it does. It has the same effect as being intrusive with a young person. The most common dynamic that we talk about in, in therapy, when we talk about family systems, is that grandparents, um, that they have a respectful distance about their opinion for the grandchildren. And your, you know, grandma and grandpa, this is for all of us, your time is not now. It's their time. My daughter said it again last night, spontaneously. She said, I think the biggest mistake that my peers make, my teenage peers make, she said, was that they don't realize that their parents are doing this for the first time. So in a lot of ways, you're not qualified to give opinions. You raise children at a different time in history with different challenges. And we know more now. So I think one of my favorite quotes I'll borrow from, I think the role is just like when you're parenting younger children, it's not time for them to learn your ways, but for you to relearn life, to continue continue to grow. I think most people get to a certain age and they imagine that they, they've arrived. I always joke and say, I think my grandparents on my mother's side, those were the ones that I had more contact with. My grandparents on my mother's side, by my best estimation, stopped learning anything new around the age of 30. They were sure of themselves. I, I don't know that, of course, for sure. But there definitely is a sense that, that old people die long before that they're dead. So to be progressive, to be open-minded, to continue to evolve, to me is one of the highest, one of my highest values. And the folks who do family systems work, who have created family systems theory and family therapy, they, they support that notion. That one of the greatest challenges in parenting is to continue to evolve as you go along and recognize the differences. I think it's more important, and most family therapists would agree, that you even remain more quiet more muted about your opinions about how your children are doing it. Remember, they're still figuring it out themselves. And your objective wise stance is less valuable than you think. A couple of times my children, in fact, it just happened recently where my child came to me with, with very direct questions about relationships. And again, I, I'm reluctant to just charge in with excitement right away. But as I started to explain to her, in fact, at one moment, I said to her, there's a chapter in one of my books that talks about this. And she said, nope, 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 nope. And I said, okay. 
I, I was just telling you where I wrote about this exact question. And she actually said, you know what? Yeah. Would you mind sending me the podcast where you talk about that? That's my own child. That is a rare exception. But mind you, that kind of exchange where she's actually taking notes about things that I'm saying, that's freaky weird for me. Right? That That's, that's way outside of the norm. That is an outlier behavior. And I would give credit if I have anything to do with that. It's because I've not been intrusive. I've not been dominating. I've not been lecturing. I don't think of my job as sitting down and teaching my children a lot of things. I remember I had a dad years ago saying to me, I just want to get to the point where my child understands that, that I have so much wisdom to give to them and they're ready to receive. And I said, I listened, I empathized, I understood, I related. And then I said, you know, the goal isn't what you say to them. The goal is your ability to listen to them. So I, I would say it's the same with the folks in their 40s who are struggling. Listen, understand. You still have to, I think in all family relationships, you still have to contain. That's a clinical word from psychoanalysis that means I have to hold on to my reactions, not just be reactive. In other words, not give a trauma response to my child where I'm over eager to fix the problem, to, to give feedback, to criticize, to, to direct. So it, it still is that same task to listen. And I'll say the last thing. I, I, again, I'm reading a book today about couple relationships. And one of the things that he says after he makes the point that all relationships essentially are based on the quality of the relationship we have with ourselves, he said that is why it's so important to continue to work on yourself, to, to, be, to continue to become more conscious. So if anything, what I would say to this, this person asking the question, this is an opportunity with your greater wisdom, your greater maturity, to be even more capable with your children. And by more capable, I'm talking about holding space for them, containing. Be very judicious in your lecturing. Be almost completely uh, off the idea of giving advice with anybody for that matter, right? The goal is to support the child, to help them get where they need to go. And even as I was talking to my daughter last night, she was asking me what gets in the way of different kinds of relationships. She was asking some more specific questions. And I was telling her, part of it is, this was a, a powerful moment. I said, part of it is, and I described my own pathology as a parent. Here's what I did to you, my best guess. And I said, here's what, you know, my wife was sitting right there. And, and I said, this is what I think mom did to you. That's our best guess. And my wife was quick to jump in and say, it's not your fault that you have this. We all have this. I have, I have, and I pass it on to you. And I said to my daughter, she actually completed my sentence. I said, she's right. Mom's right. It's not your job. What happened to you is not your responsibility. But, and then my daughter finished the sentence. She says, but it is my responsibility to deal with it. And I said, absolutely. And I can't even, you're still a child in my home. I can't fix it. And if I try to fix it, I will inadvertently, listen to this. If I try to fix it, I will inadvertently re-traumatize you in the same way I did in the first place, which is I will impose myself and my values onto you. I will, will commit the sin of intrusion, if you will. Diminish your capacity to, to figure it out yourself, to learn, to come to your own conclusions, and so forth. So I know that's a little bit of a punt, or it sounds like a punt. So many of my questions... My answers can feel like punts because the question that that I, I, I'm being asked has a premise in it that I want to push back on a little bit. That's part of it. And, and part of it is that I, I want to answer a different question related to it. Because the question about what's the difference, it's minimal. I wrote a, I wrote a blog. I'll, I'll end on this thought. I wrote a blog that was posted in Psychology Today a couple of years ago, a few years ago. And the name of the blog was Why You Should Be Your Child's Friend. And it was a playful, 
right? It was a it was a clickbait kind of title that I thought people would be drawn to because it, the title sounds controversial. Because the old adage in in American culture is you're not supposed to be your child's friend. But what I wrote about was I think the reason people I I know why people say that they're saying you have to set boundaries. You can't just make the kid happy by giving him you know treats all the time, giving in to them whatever they want. But as I thought about that, I, I thought about that emphasis, and I understand where it comes from. I also realized I think the reason that people say that is because they don't really understand what it means to be a good friend. A good friend has boundaries. A good friend tells the truth kindly. A good friend is non-intrusive. A good friend is loving and supportive, non-judgmental, compassionate, and the list goes on. So you start to describe the, the characteristics or attributes of a good friend and where do those depart from the parent? Now, yes, you have specific boundaries that you'll set with a child that, that are irrelevant to a friend, right? Your friend's not living with you. Your friend's not asking for money. On and on and on. There are specific choices within the paradigm, within the, the context that are different. But the fundamental archetypal processes are the same, which is I have to, as a parent or spouse or friend or an employer or an employee or a citizen, I have to first figure out what I need. I have to first establish my own boundaries of self-care and safety. And then from there, we start to talk about how and how it looks my relating to others. There's no greater work that you can do for anybody in your life, but to work on yourself and to, to, to continue to make what is unconscious. I love what James Hollis says. He calls it the sin of unconsciousness to make what is unconscious conscious, to be a more, more aware, more intentional instead of, like a lot of parents of adult children, you know, when, when, when adult children, when children are transitioning into adulthood or even late adolescence, I'll say to parents, the goal is that your child will want to come back to you. Like Thich Nhat Hanh says, we must love the other person in a way that the other person feels free, free specifically of our own psychological baggage of our wounds. And so for me, one of the things that I pay attention to is if my children want to spend time around me as adults, that's a wonderful gift. That's a, that, that's a wonderful reward of, of a well-developed relationship. Contrast that with my, my children feeling obligated to spend time with me. I should go home from, from Christmas. I should call my dad or I should call my mom. I don't want that. That's all ego stuff. That's all shame. That's all obligations. And as Freud clearly stated, the goal of psychotherapy is to free us from unconscious obligations. I don't want my children to come and spend time around me in the holidays and send me a Christmas card or, or excuse me, give me, send me a, a birthday note or give me a Christmas. I don't want them to do it because they should, because they feel obligated. I want it to be a natural outgrowth of the quality of the relationship. So those are my thoughts on it. I hope that's helpful. Somebody writes another piece of mid question. I wanted to ask for help in a different way. I love your podcast and truly find it helpful. I would love if you could do a role play with another therapist to provide a different example of several things. Could you, could you role play a conversation with a typical defiant teen showing boundaries? Also showing how one might respond or, or, or not respond to a defiant teen in a curious way. Also showing how to be compassionate and hold a boundary when the other is hurtful. I feel like I've just repeated myself several times. I want to try to hear how this is, might be played out instead of just what makes sense. Well, I don't have another therapist present to role play it tonight, but let me talk about these questions. These are great questions. Number one, the role plays can be difficult because of two things. Number one, I'm going to give you some examples of things that I would say to a teen. But understand this, this is the most important thing. I'm not telling you what to say. I'm giving you an example of one of many, many, many possibilities that are healthy and appropriate. In addition, um, 
teens can respond poorly to the best communication, the best boundaries, the best parenting. And the minute that we start to think as parents, if I do this right, if I do this with, with expert skill, then my child is going to respond well or differently. That idea, that energy it is felt by the child and they will be more likely in many cases to resist it or rebel against it just because they don't want that control. So when I teach parenting skills and tools, my biggest fear is that people are going to parent what I say back. And then like I've shared before, when a parent comes back to me and says, I listened empathically, I listened according to the skills, I communicated assertively, and it still didn't go well. My child is still ups upset with me. And my response is, do you hear it yet? Do you hear the problem in that, that, that telling of the story? And the problem is that you're trying to get your child not to feel what they're feeling. That's not the goal of these skills. The goal of these skills, paradoxically, is to get them to feel what they're feeling, to hold space for that. And then they work themselves through it. So the minute a parent gets into their mind, even unconsciously, the agenda of getting the child to feel or think or behave differently, they're in trouble. And this is really important and true. It's obvious what I'm about to say, even though it's not talked about a lot. My unconsciousness, my unconscious energy, whether I'm aware of it or not, and if, if it's unconscious, I'm not aware of it. My unconscious communicates with the other person's unconscious. So even though in most cases, the vast majority of cases, the child can't articulate what the problem is when they're communicating to a parent and they just throw their hands up in frustration, they just slide, they, uh, they, they, they sigh, they slam the door, they walk away, they huff and they puff, they shut down, they stop talking, all the things that, that defiant and, and struggling teens and children might do. And all of that, that, that response that I described is they're responding to, to the unnamed energy between the parent and the child. So I'll give some examples of talking to a defiant teen. The way that I talk to them is you can do whatever you want. By the way, this assumes that I can get a full sentence or two out. Let's just put that out there. You can do whatever you want, but here's my boundary. I'm not willing to, to change it. This part is not negotiable. This is the curfew. I get it. Sounds crazy. I get it. Sounds old fashioned. And regardless of what the child says, that's my message. I don't lecture. I don't convince. I don't uh, in the ideal. I don't justify. I don't explain myself. I don't try to sell them on the psychology behind my parenting. Most of the, 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 the healthy parenting parent child communication is silent. It's what, it's, what's not said, you know, there's an old saying in therapy that the master therapist prides themselves, not on what they say, not on what they say, but on what they don't say. I think that's true of parents. There are those rare exceptions, right? Very, very rare exceptions where a child calls me or, or comes to me. Well, all of my children says, talk to me. I need help. We had two in one day this week, but the point is, the point is, I think that that coming to me with that openness is because they have faith that the, that, that it's going to be a, a dialogue, a discussion, not a, not a hard and rigid formed opinion. And there's going to be no judgment, right? Whenever I talk to, I'm going to use this example generically. When my child comes to me and says, I broke up with my boyfriend, I broke up with my girlfriend, whatever it is, my response is nonplus. You know, I might say, how is it? Oh, I'm so sorry. That's so hard. But more than anything, I want to say to them, if you guys unbreak up tomorrow, it's okay with me. The child is working out their own life. Somebody wrote today uh, on social media, I saw this quote, eliciting uh, a discussion from followers saying, how does one find one's true purpose? And I didn't write. 
because I don't have time to be responding to random people. But my thought was, you figure out your bliss, you figure out your purpose by trial and error, by experimentation. I was talking about the comedian Will Ferrell the other night. I think Will Ferrell has some of the greatest sketches, skits, scenes in movies of, of anybody. And he also has some of the worst. Some that just absolutely miss. And I was telling my adult daughter this the other day. But that's the way it is, isn't it? You know, if you see Will, if you want to Google this, it's pretty funny. Will, scare, Will, Will Ferrell's um, audition tape for Saturday Night Live, if you haven't seen it, it's fascinating. The entire thing is him for two, three minutes just pretending to be a cat. No backstory, no context, nothing. Just Will Ferrell on stage with, uh, I think, a make-believe ball of yarn, a stool, and that's it. And it's not particularly funny, but you see the commitment, you see the risk, you see the, the authenticity of trying it. So the fact of the matter is, you've got to be willing to fail. You've got to be willing to get it wrong. You've got to take some, some risks in this, in this process. To be authentic, to be spontaneous, to be a self, you, you've got to screw up. And, and, and more than anything, I think it, the best thing is that we model for our children that humanness, right? We're raising humans. We're not raising objects. We're not trying to get our children to be good or, or perfect, of course. We're trying to raise them to be human, fallible. And, and ultimately, see, this is the, it's all just a little bit obscured by what the culture teaches us. Ultimately, we're trying to teach them to love themselves. And when we get agitated, angry, impatient, which I do, when we get anxious, dominating, fearful, frustrated, disappointed, all of that energy, which would be better spent and better communicated somewhere else with my therapist, with my support group, with my, with my spouse, my co-parent. But when we, when we show that, that or, or communicate that energy to our child, the child walks away feeling like something's wrong with them, right? Due to our, our, our genetic wiring, the child, the young child thinks, I have to do it differently because if my parent gets frustrated, disappointed, angry, scared, upset, the list goes on. With me, they might abandon me. I will lose connection with them. And I need connection just to live, right? That's wired into the, 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 the homo sapien brain. So the child experiences our dysregulation as not something's wrong with mom or dad, the child experiences our, our dysregulated nervous system, our trauma responses, our unhealed parts of ourselves. They experience it as something is wrong with them. So, how you communicate boundaries with a with a with a an oppositional child is clearly. Here's the rule: when the child threatens you, you say, you know, you're allowed to threaten. You're allowed to do anything you want. You take the responsibility for your own nervous system regulation. No is a, is a complete sentence. Listening is better than talking most of the time. Teaching is better by being a, a work in progress than by getting it right and extolling the, the, the virtues and the wisdom that you have from, from the throne that you sit on, right, as, as the parent. The goal is to get inside of their head to support their development. And all of that is built on the foundation of your healing, your boundaries. Uh, you, yes, you know, you have your values and you're allowed to absolutely unqualified. You're allowed to demonstrate your values in your life with your family and your children. That is the, the right of a parent in this country, at least. In most countries. But you also expand. The more you listen, the less you say, the more you grow. And this is a key point that I'll, that I'll end on. If you don't take care of yourself, if you don't learn to love your horrible, rotten self, 
If you don't learn to earn, own your crap, your, your baggage, your unhealed parts, your trauma, and work on them, not, not complete the work, just work on them, take responsibility for them. If you don't take on the responsibility, if you don't realize that your unhappiness and dissatisfaction in, in life is your responsibility, you will project that, that unowned project onto your children and the people in, in, that are close to you in the form of criticism and anger, resentment. So again, I'll, I'll try to, maybe I'll ask my, my, my wife or my adult daughter to come in and do a role play with me. Libby, if you can save that, that question, uh, put it in, in a file so that when there is an opportunity for me to do a dialogue, I'll give you several examples. Most of them aren't going to show immediate results. Most of my role plays, nothing's going to change. And good parenting, just like good therapy, is invisible if you're watching it for the most part. Because it's a person staying quiet and regulated. It's a person not reacting. It's a person who's taking responsibility for their own peace and serenity and not outsourced it to the child who is incapable of shouldering that responsibility. All right. Are there any other questions, Livia? I haven't seen any others come in. Nope. Well, folks, maybe that means that you're all content. Um, yeah, those are a couple of good questions. So I think, I think we can wrap up and just talk about upcoming stuff. So I'll just kind of pause. So my two books, The Journey of the Rogue Parent and The Audacity to Be You are available on Amazon and Audible. You can check them out there. If you want to attend an intensive, this is for me a springboard into your own work. Or if you're already in therapy, it's an acceleration of the work that you're already doing in your week-to-week -week therapy. February 21st through 25th is the next available slot in person. January 26th through 28th, there's an online spot available. March 6th through 10th is the sequel, Returning to You that I will also be, be hosting, excuse me. And then of course, as I mentioned earlier, the workshop that my wife and I are running will be February 7th through 11th. We have a couple, one couple spot available for that. We also have custom finding connection for couples and co-parents. So you can customize your own intensive or finding family for families. Just contact intensives at evoketherapy.com. We have support groups for wilderness, current and alumni families. January 18th is that next offering, 7 p.m. Mountain Time. Once a month, we have an alumni-only meeting for our wilderness families. February 19th at 6 p.m. Mountain Time is that offering. And then a once a month for intensives and coaching clients, February 12th at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Contact support groups at evoketherapy.com to find out more, to register, or go to our website. We have coaches with a wide variety of background, all introduced to this, this attachment-based work that I talk about and teach about. So if you want to be able to do something virtual, with a coach, you can do that anywhere in the world and sign up. Contact coaching at evoketherapy.com. This is for parents, co-parents, marriage issues, stage of life, stage of life issues, um, codependency, anxiety, a whole host of issues. They can help you with that. Coaching at evoketherapy.com. We ask all current parents to try to attend at least any combination of the following 12-step support groups. Alanon.org, coda.org familiesanonymous.org or adultchildren.org. You can also go to refugerecovery.org. That's a Buddhist-inspired Buddhist -inspired support group that has left as, less of an emphasis on a higher power. Or you can contact the National Alliance on Mental Illness, nami.org, for free classes and resources in your local community. You can always check them out. You can listen to all these broadcasts on your favorite podcast app or Spotify. Just search Finding You in Evoke Therapy Podcast or go to soundcloud.com on your computer and listen there. You can go to Evoke's YouTube channel and watch the rebroadcast versions, uh, the video versions of these. Just go to Evoke's YouTube channel and you'll see all of our library there. You can find Evoke Therapy programs and me, Dr. Brad Reedy, on X, Threads, and Instagram using the handles at Evoke Therapy and at Dr. Brad Reedy, respectively. You can find Evoke Therapy Intensives on Instagram using the handle at Evoke Therapy Intensives. And on Facebook, you can find us by searching Evoke Therapy Programs or Evoke Therapy Intensives. And then, of course, our blog has wonderful content each week. 
All right, looks like no new questions have come in. My next broadcast will be in 48 hours. I'll be talking about repairing relationship fractures with your children. This was a specific request. What happens when you've hurt the child? What happens when there's a significant fracture? What is the pathway back to reconciliation? I think that's a great one for a lot of families. January 18th, that's two nights from tonight, 6 p.m. Mountain Time, repairing relationship fractures with your children. All right, folks, I hope this is a helpful point of contact during the week and for and on behalf of the people that you love and the people that love you. Thank you for showing up and being willing to do your work. It makes all the difference in the world. Have a great evening and I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.